Do the switches on the power memory, yeah? It doesn't have to stop at the end of January. It's Psalm 65, 11. It says, He crowns our year with goodness, and He drenches our paths with green. How many of you like to begin, and we almost end with this month, the year with goodness? To crown the year with goodness. So God wants us to remember His goodness as we start the year. Amen. So this morning, I want to follow up with, I'm going to ask, um, what do you think it is? The two most important things for every believer. And I think you heard one of the two important things last week. Right? Um, hearing the voice of God. Recognizing the voice of God. Discerning His voice from your own voice, from the voice of others, from the voice of the devil. We're um, not just hearing, but hearing. So, besides hearing and hearing the voice of God, what do you think is the second most important thing as believers we need to do? We want because the whole voice of God is based on His Word, right? So besides um, knowing the Word of God, what else? What does God want us to do all the time? Something without ceasing. Pray. Pray. Yeah. Right. And uh, and it's a, it's like a two sides of a coin: prayer and hearing, or prayer and the Word. Prayer is like the marination to what we hear. You know, it's like the spirit behind the Word. The grace of God too. Hear from him and the grace to heed his word. So I'm going to talk about prayer this morning, um, and you can, and I would probably call it restoring the spirit and purpose of prayer. Restoring the spirit of prayer and the purpose of prayer. And I think because many Christians try to pray in the wrong spirit with the wrong spirit, which is basically unbelief, and they don't know the purpose of prayer, they struggle to pray. <coughs> Why pray? And, uh, and prayer has for many become a very fruitless activity that we don't recognize the purpose of, we don't see the, the results or we don't connect the results of our prayer. And so that is why it is the smallest meeting usually in most churches. The majority of churches prayer meetings are the smallest meetings. And, um, and I'm going to share a few things that what prayer is not before I, I, I share what it is and what the spirit of prayer is. And, um, and I actually started to, I wanted to show this on the PowerPoints but I changed my mind to not sure about points, but I shall just read a few points of what I shared. Um, what prayer is not? Prayer is not a magic wand. Okay? And how do you know if you think it is some prayer? You know some people believe prayer is a magic wand because they say, Pastor, I pray nothing happened, what's wrong with God? Right? Have you heard that kind of thinking mindset? I pray nothing happened. God's got a problem. Right? Prayer is not a magic wand. Prayer is not a, a, a lamp like a genie. You rub a prayer in the wish is my command. Prayer is not to make God your servant and do his boss. Prayer does not tell God what to do for you. We're going to get this our mindset right. Okay? Prayer is not reserved only for test trials and emergencies. Right? No problem, no prayer. A lot of problems, a lot of prayer. Right? And, many, and the sad thing is many times we are motivated to pray when we have a problem. But that's not the purpose of prayer. Okay, prayer is not a religious duty or ritual. To pray for the sake of praying because we are Christians. What to do we have to pray? Prayer is not for public display to show how spiritual we are. In fact, in Matthew 6, when Jesus teaches about prayer, it is very interesting. As he started his ministry, Jesus chose to teach on prayer and nothing else. He could have thought about faith. He could have thought about how to heal the sick. He thought about prayer. In fact, the disciples asked him, God teaches how to pray. So one of the first things that Jesus thought of at the start of his ministry, and, uh, and, and, he, and he wants his disciples, he says, look, when you pray, do not pray to be heard, to show how holy you are, how spiritual you are in public. But he says, when you go to your room and shut the door, and your father who sees your prayer in secret will reward you openly. But when you pray to be seen in public, that is your reward. So we come to the, the motive of prayer. You know, why do we pray? And that's, that's restoring the spirit of prayer. This morning we restore what is the motive of, of prayer? Why does God want us to pray? What is prayer? Or why does He want us to pray? Okay, some of the things that prayer is, it is submission to you. It tells us to pray, right? So when you pray, you are submitting to God. You obey God. God says pray, you pray, it's obedience. When you do the right, when you do it with faith. Okay? But I think greater than, than just obedience is 
Prayer reveals our total dependence and reliance on Him. Right? The more you realize you have nothing and can do nothing, the more you realize that at any second enough of God's grace you drop dead, you pray. Right? And when you've been in ministry long enough and been in the hospital as many times as you have, just pray for sick patients and see the sick and dying and go and somebody's dying, you have a revelation of how much we depend on God to sustain us. The none of them, nobody in the hospital chose to be in the hospital. Right? There were circumstances beyond their control. So you don't take health for granted. Say, oh God, I thank you for the gift of life. I thank you for the gift. And that's a form of prayer. Right? That's where prayer really begins. The spirit of prayer really begins with gratitude. Independence and gratitude. Okay? Um, and that's the third point. Prayer reveals gratitude. That's what it is. Prayer is to change us and not to change God. It's not to twist God's arm and make him do something that he's reluctant to do. Okay, prayer really positions us in his grace and favor to humility and faith. And I'm going to remember that, that not all prayer is effective. Just because you pray doesn't mean God is hearing. You realize that? In fact, um, even the religious leaders who, who crucified, who reported, who betrayed Jesus, they were people of prayer. They prayed. They had to. They started as Pharisees and Sadducees. Scribes, they had to pray. That was the duty of every faithful Jew. They had to pray. But so did the disciples of Jesus also pray. How do you know that not everybody's prayer was heard? So did those who followed Christ. So just because we pray doesn't mean that we are heard. And sometimes because we're not sure, we don't just say, oh, what's the point? God, I don't even know God tells me why should I bother praying. It doesn't seem to make any difference in my life. Right? So James chapter 5, verse 16 says. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Not any prayer from any man, but the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. It's effective. Righteous through faith, right? That's how we made righteous through faith. Hebrews 11, 6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please him. So if you pray without faith, your prayer will not please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He who comes to God must believe that he is. That means just because you come to God to pray doesn't mean you believe he's there. Doesn't mean that you believe he hears you. A lot of people come before God and pray because they have to pray. It be the big question. Did you pray today? Right? If you're a child, your parents says, don't forget your prayer time. Yes, I have to do my duty. So when we come to God through prayer, believe that He is actually with you, that He is hearing you, that He is leading you, and rewards those who diligently seek Him, not casually seek Him. Do you remember that story of Jesus walking, and the crowds are following Him, and there was a woman with the issue of blood, and she had been bleeding for 12 years, and she was lost her, her you know, when you lose blood, you lose your energy, you lose your, your vitality, doctors couldn't fix the problem. And he came to revelation. If I just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be able. And so, in a weakness, she pushed through the crowd that was following, that was walking. I don't know how far she had walked. But not only she had to catch up with Jesus, she had to go through the crowds to reach Jesus, to reach a moving target. Now she weak, she's a woman. I'm sure many men were surrounding Jesus, the disciples were. And so she had to push through this tough, strong guys to get between them, to reach the hem, and Jesus wasn't standing still waiting to be touched. He was on the go, he was walking. Imagine how challenging it was. And he had no idea what was happening until he was touched. Isn't that amazing? He had no idea what had happened or what this woman was up to, that somebody is following him, and somebody's going to touch him until she actually touched him. And so when she touched the hem of his garment, he stopped and said, Who touch me? The disciples said, Lord, you know, Master, what kind of question is that? Can't you see the people all around you? Everyone's touching you. And to me, that's a picture of prayer. Everyone prays. Every Christian prays. Or many do. But not many pray or touch him with expectation and faith. She knew, she said, if when I touch him, I will be made whole. How many of us have the same period of faith that we pray? When I pray, I know the Lord is listening to me. When I pray, I know he is hearing. When I pray, I know he will respond to my prayer. You see, it's not the fact that you touch him or that you pray, but how you touch him while you pray. 
This is the spirit of faith in your prayer. See, without faith, we cannot please God no matter what we do. You can pray all day long, but you pray in unbelief, your prayer does not please God. You can read the Bible all day long, but your readings without faith, without change, as Pastor Anthony said, we let the Bible read us. We let God read us. And we don't let the word read us, and we read in unbelief. Our reading does not please God. There are lots of non Christians who know more of Scripture than Christians. You believe that? I got A for Bible this day. I went to a convent. I went to Methodist Boys School. I went to Christian Fellowship. And they have all the head knowledge, but they're not saved. So just because you read the word doesn't mean you're a believer. Just because you pray doesn't make you saved. And just because you go to church doesn't mean you're a Christian. You know, otherwise going to McDonald's make you a big man. Okay? Or be born in the garage and make you a car. You know, God has no grandchildren. Right? Your, your, your father, grandfather can be the Pope and the bishop, doesn't mean you're a child of God. You cannot go to heaven on your spouse's ticket, your father's ticket, your mother's ticket, as some people think. Oh, I let my wife pray, I, I, I'll go on her ticket. No, no, you have to get your own ticket. <laughs> and that's in scripture. You remember the ten legends? You know why the five foolish didn't make it? They, they thought they could make it on the five wisest oil. They said, oh no, the bride kingdom has come and uh, oil is finished. Uh, five wise ones, can we have some of your oil? Sorry, you got to go in your own oil. You can't get into heaven, you can't bribe on somebody else's anointing. Somebody else's prayer for you. Because God has no grandchildren or in-laws, all cousins or relatives, we're all his children. Amen? So we have to stand before him. So, you got to know what does it mean to pray? So the question is, Luke 18 verse 1 says, Then he spoke a parable to them, to the disciples, saying that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. Luke 18 1. Men always need to pray and not lose heart. 1 Thessalonians 5 17. Pray without ceasing. And I just remembered, I did not open and pray, did I? Let's so open and pray. <laughs> Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord. We commend this, this sharing your word to you. We pray, Lord, that you would give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the purpose of prayer, what prayer is, and restore the spirit of purpose of prayer in our lives, Lord. We thank you for the grace to be renewed in the spirit of our minds, to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. For your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Men always ought to pray and not be silent. So that tells me. The greatest challenge to prayer is to lose heart. You know why many lose heart? How many don't pray is? They feel there's no, it's not effective. I don't see any change. I'm praying and, and I don't see anything happening, so why bother praying? It's like, I'll just give a token prayer. And then again, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, Paul writes, pray without ceasing. Okay, now this is a very misunderstood phrase, pray without ceasing. How many of you know that Jesus did not pray without ceasing in the way we think praying without ceasing means? How many of you know that when Jesus was baptized, maybe he did that before his ministry started. But when he got baptized and was stepped into the wilderness and started to minister, he did not stay in his house all day and pray and nothing else. He was out ministering. But yet we all know he must have prayed without ceasing. So how was it possible for Jesus to pray without ceasing without being in his closet 24-7? And that means we've got to redefine what praying without ceasing actually means. It is not just to pray all day and do nothing. You know what happens when you do that? You become so heavy minded, you have no other use. But when you are actually have the mind of Christ, you'll be very useful on earth. You know, Jesus was both heavenly minded and very fruitful on earth. And, and so we're going to find out this morning what it actually means to how to pray without ceasing. And, and the verse that says that I pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5, that really captures the heart of prayer. You know, there's three verses, very short verses. Uh, verse 16, 17, and 18. You can, you can look at it if you want to. First Thessalonians is the end of the New Testament. The end of the back of your Bible. Uh, it's a small book. In fact, I don't I know how to read it. I don't have to turn to it. It says, I think it's 16, 17, and 18. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing and in everything. Give thanks. So these are the rejoice always is probably one of two shortest verses in the whole Bible. The other one is Jesus wept. That's one verse. This is the other short verse. Rejoice always. Two words. After you rejoice, then pray without ceasing. 
The next verse is, in everything give thanks. So prayer is sandwiched between rejoicing and thanksgiving. And that is the spirit of prayer. You know why that, that is so? Why does God tell us to first rejoice and pray and give thanks so that we don't pray in unbelief? Right? Have you noticed that it's very hard? I don't know any song of praise or worship that magnifies all your problems. Have you, have you heard a Christian composer writing a song that talks about your problems? No. What's the spirit of praise to magnify the Lord? But what's the problem with our prayers? Many times we start praying with telling God about our problems. Right? That's like God saying, hey, before you pray, sing, so you don't come to me with your problems first. Magnify me before you tell me of your problems. And this is the spirit of prayer, which is faith. How do we pray in faith? By starting with rejoicing. How often? Sometimes. Did it say rejoice only when you pray? No. Rejoice always and pray without ceasing. So rejoicing and prayer are both to be done all the time. But Jesus never did that, right? You don't know, see him singing all day. He was ministering, he was preaching, teaching, healing the sick. But you know what I believe happened? How did he pray without ceasing? He always had the spirit of joy, gladness, and thanksgiving. And really the heart of prayer is the constant awareness of the presence of the Holy Spirit with you and upon you. You're always aware. And I like what Bill Johnson says. He said, look, when Jesus came out of the waters of Jordan and the Spirit of God came upon him like a dove, not a little dove, but like a dove, and it says, rested upon him. Now, if a, if a dove actually sat on your shoulder, landed on your shoulder, and your objective was to keep the dove on your shoulder, how would you move throughout the day? Every step you take will be with the dove in mind. So that you do nothing to cause the dove to take off. And that is the spirit of prayer. But you are constantly aware of God's presence in you, within, upon you, no matter what you do throughout the day. So though Jesus didn't lock himself up and pray 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, he never forgot the presence of the Holy Spirit that remained upon him in all that he did throughout the day. See, the biggest problem today is we do our morning prayer, we do our night prayer, we pray like heaven morning and night and then we live like hell in between. <laughs> right? We forget we're Christians. We walk out of our house, we go to work and we do business just like the world. We talk just like the world. We come into the house, we put on our sheep's clothing. We go to our office and we become, we take out our sheep's clothing and become goats. See, there's not just wolves in sheep's clothing, there are many goats in sheep's clothing. When around sheep, they behave like sheep. When around goats, they behave like goats. And we have compartmentalized our lives. We are all very Christ-like around believers. But we speak and act and think like hell around unbelievers. And we wonder why our prayer is not effective. And so to pray without ceasing is to constantly live in an attitude, be mindful of God's presence no matter what you do. It's not just, it doesn't mean that you're, you're always multitasking on that. Some, and not, no problem with that, it's good. When you drive, you pray, or pray, when you, when you do work, whatever. But we also need to set ourselves apart like Jesus did. You wake up early in the morning or stay up late at night, sometimes he would withdraw himself in the middle of the day. But the spirit of prayer really is the spirit of faith that is bathed in thanksgiving and praise. Right? So I'm going to look at the key verse for prayer, or the, the, the purpose of prayer. Basically, prayer is to answer and fulfill God's will on ours. You know what Jesus said? I came to do my Father's will. That I didn't come to do my own will. When, when the family of Jesus came while he was preaching, and he was told, you know, oh, your, your mother, your brothers are here, and he asked the question, who oh, are my mother, my brothers? Whoever does the will of my Father is my family. So the family of Christ was not based on, on relationship, but based on submission to the Father's will. And so, prayer is not about what I want. It's what God wants me. In fact, I believe that when we pray to become the answer to God's prayer, all our needs will be met. This is what Matthew 6 says, Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added. What do most of us do? We are praying for things to be added. Lord, I need this thing, I need that thing, I need this thing, and we never seek His kingdom. We think, God, when all these things are added, then maybe I will seek your kingdom. But they sorry, wrong about that. When you put His kingdom first, all these things you need to be taken care of. If we have children, do any of the children need to keep asking you for whatever it is on? Can you hear me? Yes. Do any of the children have to keep asking you to be fed? Tell me, mommy. 
my parents on earth, please give me breakfast. Daddy, mommy, I come to you in the name of the child. Please feed me lunch. <laughs> please give me a bit to sleep. Of course not. Why? It's your inheritance of the relationship. You don't have to ask for those things. He gives it to you as a father, but make sure you do your father's work. Right? Don't live in, in rebellion and stubbornness and do your own thing and expect to be receive the blessings of the house. So when we put the will of the father, Jesus put the will of his father, his own needs were taken care of. Right? So prayer really is not my will but God's be done. And I believe that the more we are, we are the more our prayer is around, God, what is your will for me? What do you want? Why did you save us? Why did you save me? What's your purpose for me? And we are mindful of God's desire for us. He takes care of us. You don't have to ask for the things. He knows our needs, right? He's God. He knows what you need. the bird where you can count the ribs. They always seem to be quite fat. Right? There are no guarantees where they're going to find the next one. No guarantees where the food's going to be. What if there's bad weather? Somehow, whenever they're hungry, there's food to eat. Now, if God takes care of the sparrows, and He knows when the sparrow falls, how much more will He take care of you? Why are we stressed out? Somebody said, worry is like a rocking chair. A lot of action, but it's in nowhere. The chair doesn't move. It just moves on the spot. Right? So, and the key verse, I believe, for, for the talks about the, the spirit and purpose of prayer is in 2 Chronicles. Um, but before we look at that, let's look at Exodus 33. Exodus 33, verse 17. And then 2 Chronicles tells us how to, how to receive what Moses received. Exodus 33, verse If I found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight. Isn't that interesting to see grace beginning and end? If I found grace, show me your way that I may know you and find grace. And consider that this nation is your people. And verse 14, the Lord replied, My presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And this is a very important verse 14. My presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And this is one of the key purposes of prayer. That when you are mindful of His presence, whatever we do is done with the knowledge of His presence so that we can do what we do in His rest. Now this is the true Sabbath rest of God. The rest of God is not just sleeping all day one day a week. It's not just not going to work on Sundays. Okay, that's the Old Testament. Yes, it's good to take a day off a week, but the real rest of God is staying in His peace and presence every day of the week. So then all that we do, we're not, we're not working out of stress. We're not working out of frustration. We're not working that burns you out. Know, Jesus was never burnt out. I mean, think about it. He waited for 30 years before he would start working. He only worked for three years. Talk about early retirement. He only chose 12 disciples, not 120. And he said, I'm done, I'm finished. See, why did Jesus, why did God rest on the seventh day? He doesn't get tired. Why did he rest? Because he's finished. When you complete the assignment, you rest. You stop. So we need to enter into what God has completed. So we need to prioritize our prayer is to remind us, hey, I need the presence of God on me. I need to stay in His rest. What's the rest of God? It's not doing nothing. It is doing what you do in His peace, the knowledge of His presence. And these two words, presence and rest, defines the house of God, the very first time the house of God is mentioned in the Bible. In Genesis 28, you see that you know, the first mention of the house of the Lord is when Jacob had a dream, the heavens were open, the ladder of the angels going up and down, and then he woke up and he said, surely God is here, and then he turned away. This is the house of the Lord. So God is here in the presence of God. And then what did the Lord tell him? Take that stone, you put your head on the pillow, anoint you with oil, and this shall be my house. So the first symbol of the house of God was the pillow that became a pillar anointed with oil. Isaiah 60 or 66 says, where can I find a house of rest? Do you wonder why Joseph and Mary 
went to the inn to give birth. What, why, why do people go to the inn? To rest, right? They don't go there to work in Amman. They go out, they come back in time for rest. What do animals do in the manger? Rest. When they're outside the manger, I don't know what they do. They walk around, sit together. Who knows? But they come back to the manger to rest. And so God wants, and, and this is the picture of Revelation 3, the, the church of the earth. He said, I stand at the door and not the door of his house. Because the, the church of Laodicea were inside the house working, but without his presence and without his rest. They were so busy, and the noise of their work was so loud, they didn't hear the knock of the Lord. And so, the purpose of prayer is to make sure that all we do is done with the spirit of faith, mindful of his presence, staying in his rest, so that nobody can rock your peace. We become thermostats and not thermometers. You know the difference is? Thermostats set the temperature, thermometers reflect the temperature. So we are called to be spiritual thermostats to release peace. Jesus told the disciples, when you send them two by two, he says, when you enter home, release your shalom. Just like Noah releasing the dove. The, the, the olive and the dove came back with the olive branch. But when there's no peace, no trick on the land, they came back. But when there was dry ground, the dove that symbolizes peace, universally today, right, United Nations, which is not really peaceful. <laughs> but the, the dove represents peace. And so, Moses is saying, Lord, if I found grace in your sight, show me a way that I may know you and find grace. And the response to Moses' prayer was, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. So now this prayer of Moses is revealed in 2 Chronicles 7.14. Okay, and, and this is a very well-known scripture, especially there's one day a year that the church in, in America, many nations, they call it the Day of Repentance, Global Day of Repentance, and they focus on this verse, which says in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, If my people called by my name will humble themselves, pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. So my people called by my name. What's significant about being called by His name? The authority of prayer is in His name. Jesus said, when you pray in my name to my Father. So if you are called by my name, you're going to use my name to pray. Firstly, you need to humble yourself. In my people, because how do you know that just because you pray doesn't mean you have authority? Remember the seven sons of Stephen? What did they say? They came across the demon-possessed people and they said, you know, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, we command him to get out. What happened? They were beaten up by the demons. So the demons said, Jesus, you know, Paul, we know who are you. Right? So the question is, are you known in hell? Okay. If you're not known in hell, you're not such the enemy. If your prayers carry authority. The prayers of the scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees have zero authority. The prayers of the disciples carry a lot of authority. You see, it's not how loud we pray, it's how fluent we pray. It's, it's that authority in your prayer. I mean, what prayer did the thief on the cross make? Right? It wasn't any long prayer. It was an expression of faith. Lord, I believe who you are. And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. There was no sinner's prayer on the cross. Jesus didn't say, follow me in this prayer. Uh, dear Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross. Yeah, I can see you on the cross. <laughs> and by faith, I believe you'll rise on the third day. No, no. Jesus didn't even lead him in a prayer. It was an expression of faith that saved him. You see, you can take a parent to say the sinner's prayer doesn't mean the parent is saved. How many of you know that parents and minors have the office? They can repeat what they hear. Doesn't mean they're saved. So prayer is, is more beyond mere talk. God wants us to be mindful, to be always conscious of His presence, so that we know that His presence is with us and great joy. So as I said, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, they might people call by my name. What's the next step? Before you pray, humble yourselves. You could have said, you might people call by my name, pray. So it doesn't start with prayer, it says, humble yourselves and then pray. So why does God have to insert that word of humble yourselves? It tells us that not everybody who prays is humble. Just because you pray doesn't mean you're humble. The humble will pray, but not all who pray are humble. Right? The proud will see no need to pray. Because the proud are more self-sufficient than God intended. But why should I pray? I'm a self made man, I don't need God's help. So pride leads to prayerlessness. But prayer is not the evidence of humility. So what is humility? Humility first recognizes the need to pray, that our whole existence and life depends on God. But the great aspect of humility in prayer is, what is your focus as you pray? So my
my people talk about my name will humble themselves, pray and seek my face. Not seek your problem. And that's why we need humility. If you don't pray humility, God, I come to you with all my problems. God, you see how big this mountain is? No, no, no. Before you come to God with your mountains, seek His goodness. And that requires humility. You see, it takes humility to lay down your problems and to come with rejoicing always before you pray. So the humbling ourselves is rejoice always and then pray without ceasing and in everything you thanks. And that is why in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus said, this is how you pray. He taught his disciples. Pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's the rejoicing always. That's the humbling yourself. It's not our Father in heaven, how great are my problems. You know, it's hallowed be your name before you talk about your problems. God wants us to come with the spirit of gratitude. And this is so important. Only one of the most important truths in life for a believer in prayer is the spirit of gratitude. Because this is the very reason I believe that Lucifer fell and all the Israelites that left Egypt died in the wilderness. Because the challenges, the constant challenges for the Israelites, I don't, it's like they got fed up with the manna, they wanted meat, they had no water, and all the one problem of the other made them forget what the Lord had done. They forgot that they were delivered from Pharaoh, from Egypt. They forgot that they were, they had an unreasonable amount of work to do. You know, to build not enough bricks, not enough straw, not enough hay. How to fulfill the quota? They were in bondage, they were slaves. They forgot how God parted the Red Sea, how he, all the first part of the Egyptian side, but they were spared. How there was darkness, but they had light. They forgot all the goodness of God. And all they did was mumble, mumble, complain. Moses was wrong with him. Moses bears the water. Moses fell out of his bed. Moses, we missed the onions and the garlic. And, what, and, and when how did the ingratitude cost them 40 years in the wilderness? When they saw the giants. Because they forgot the deliverance of the Lord. They said, the giants are too first, we cannot take the land. And they all did believe Joshua and Caleb. And see, un- ingratitude is really comes from and leads to unbelief. It's hard to walk in faith if you don't remember what the Lord has done. See, when David saw the lion, he immediately remembered, Lord, you delivered the lion and bear from my hand will deliver the lion from my hand. But if you forget the lion and the bear, if you forget what God has done, you'll have no faith for what needs to be done. So you cannot separate faith from gratitude. That's why 1 Thessalonians 5 says, Before you pray always, rejoice always. Before you pray always, rejoice without ceasing. In other words, live with an attitude of gratitude. And so that's where the humility comes in. My people call by my name, humble themselves and pray as faith seekers, not as problem seekers. Not coming to God with all your needs. He knows what your problems are. Forget about yourself and thank you for who he is. And I believe this is the key verse for this year, 2022. You know the key verse of 2022 is 2 Chronicles 2022. Never forget it. You know 2 Chronicles 22, 2022 says? You don't know? It's in your Bible. Okay, I shall read it for you. In fact, I believe 2 Chronicles 2020 was the verse of two years ago. So, so and this is one reason why I think we are, we are at the book end of this pandemic. A second Chronicles about the kings. Okay, I'll read verse 20 and then verse 22. 2 Chronicles 2020, which, which I stood on two years ago in the year 2020, it says, Second half of the verse, believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established, believe his prophets and you shall prosper. So as the pandemic began two years ago, the Lord has said, look, this year of 2020, remember what the Lord has promised, remember what the prophets have declared, remember my purpose for the nation, my purpose for you, so that you shall be established and prosper. That was 2020. Now we look at verse 22, 2 Chronicles 2022, it says, now when they began to sing and to praise, see the rejoicing always, the Lord has set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. When were the enemies of God's people defeated? And the people of God, called by His name, sought His face, but rejoicing always. Don't forget him. See, that's why we need to live in praise so that we never go flat. <laughs> you know, sometimes I think God wants to use us. But when he wants to call us, he says, are you flat battery? <laughs> We're not filled with the Spirit. Okay? We need to stay full of the Spirit. So, 2 Chronicles 20, 22 says, And they began to sing and to praise. The Lord said, Ambitious. You have enemies, you have mountains, you have challenges, we all have. What's God's strategy for coming against the enemies? It's not being focused on the enemy. 
Do not seek me your enemy. Nothing, Lord, I pray against my enemy. Lord, judge our enemies. Curse them, kill them. The Lord says, focus on me, see my face, don't seek your enemy. Look at me and praise me for what I am. Praise me for what I've done. And when we magnify the Lord, He takes care of your enemies. Amen. See, praise is the only form of warfare that does not magnify the enemy. Praise is the only form of spiritual warfare that magnifies the Lord and He takes care of your enemies. And so in this year of 2022, we have to be so careful that we don't get distracted by what the enemy is doing. Begin to live in thanksgiving and praise, and the Lord will take care of your enemies. Second Chronicles 2022. So this is how we need to humble ourselves. And why is it so important to humble ourselves? There's two key verses on humility, pride and humility in the New Testament. In James and 1 Peter, they are side by side. James 4, 6 and 1 Peter 5, 5 and 6. And they both say, um, God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. Okay, now, take note of this. God loves both the proud and the humble, but only one is His favor. See, the favor of God is not the same as the love of God. Just because believers, there are many believers today who go to church and pray, and they're going through so much struggles and problems, it does not mean that God does not love them. It means they're not walking in His favor. Because God gives grace to the humble, not grace to those He loves. You see, the, how we receive this love depends not just on I'm loved by position. No, no. How I many you know that the prodigal son was loved by Father even while he was in the wilderness? Right? Just because the Father loved the prodigal did not mean that the Father went and bound in search and rescue and dragged the prodigal back. So while the prodigal was suffering in the wilderness, he was still loved by his Father. How do you know that? And the son came home. That showed the Father never stopped loving him. So just because you love doesn't mean you walk in his favor. The favor of God is, is, is conditional on two things. See, many times we say, oh, grace is free. Yes, it's free, but it's not unconditional. If grace was unconditional, nobody would be in hell. Right? Hell would be empty and hell be full because there's no condition. No, grace is free, but it's conditional on faith and humility. God gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. We access his grace through faith, Romans 5.5. Because the humble do not believe. I mean the proud do not believe. The humble will believe. So, if my people call by my name will humble themselves. Now, in these two scriptures in James and 1 Peter, humility has to do with submission. We mentioned both. James talks about submit to God, which is to pray. And then 1 Peter talks about submit to your elders and to one another. So, you cannot, the, the essence of, of humility is submission. You know, where we, that's where we get the word submarine. Same first three letters. Sub SUV means to go under. So, sub, so just as a submarine goes under the marine, it's submerged, it's submerged under the marine, submission is to go under the mission of another. Submission. Okay, you're humbling yourself under God's mighty hand. And that's what prayer is. You're not standing at your own ability. You're saying, Lord, I humble myself, I come under your authority. I honor those who give me. I choose to walk in, in submission to one another. I choose to pray. Okay, so my people humble themselves by walking in submission to pray. If my people call by my name will humble themselves and seek my face and not come to me with all their problems first. First, praise me for who I am. Then what happens? How do you seek his face? Rejoice always. In everything give thanks. Rehearse your blessings. Rehearse your testimonies. Don't forget what the Lord has done. 2 Chronicles 20, 22. As you begin to magnify and fully take care of your enemies. And guess what happens? As you begin to seek his face, we are focusing on the goodness of God. That's what the face, the face of God really speaks of the presence. It's like in the Old Testament it was the Ark. Okay, as the Ark of the Covenant was in the Old, the face of God is in the New. It's the presence of God. In other words, pray with His goodness before your eyes. Don't pray with your own problems in front of your eyes. The ten spies saw the giants so big, they, 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 had, they lost their faith. Joshua and Caleb saw the giant and then looked up, God, you're much bigger. They saw the face of God, just like King David. So when we begin to seek his face through praise, through thanksgiving, the spirit of faith increases, and guess what? Now we can come to the prayer without ceasing. Now your prayers will come from faith. Now your prayers will come from the place of presence and rest. You remember, you remember Moses on the mountain top, Aaron and her on each side? They were holding his hands, because they were still sitting down. What was happening down in the valley? Joshua was fighting against the Amalekites. How many of you know that it took great faith for Moses to remain seated? 
And Moses is a spiritual leader, and your church member is an army warrior general. What you want to see? What's happening? Yeah, who's winning it? Joshua or the other guy? How to sit down? I want to get up and look. Who's dying? Who? Where are the home casualties? Can you imagine? It's not easy to remain seated and be so at rest while there's a war going on. Remember something, you see? He prepares the table before us in the presence of. You raise a hallelujah in the. In the song, raise a hallelujah in the presence of. Enemies. You see, the presence of God does not mean the omission of enemies. You see, the cross does not mean you're not forcing. The Bible says, by his stripes we have been healed. Not by his stripes we will never be sick. There is no need for a healer if you will never fall sick. See, the cross does not provide immunity but authority to overcome. Otherwise, they will say, by his stripes, you shall always be healthy. No, no, no. By his stripes, you shall be healed. That means when you fall sick, you can believe for healing. Right? So, the presence of God does not mean you have no enemies. The presence of God means you can be at press rest, you can be in his presence, enjoy the table, and let God take an enemy. You don't have to pray from stress. You know, it's amazing how, I don't know whether you notice if you have been in, in, in the denominational churches, there are too many people who pray with so much anger. You think, you think that the devil is special, you know? They're shouting and yelling and screaming. And, oh. You suddenly wonder if they think the devil is deaf. Right? You think the louder they shout, the more they frighten the devil. Anyway. And then they're marching up and down and they're sweating, you know, all the sweat is Maybe you no know, aircon is not cold enough. <laughs> you see, the devil is not intimidated by a volume, but by authority. And we have no authority outside of his presence, outside of his rest. That's why you've got to humble yourself, not only to pray, but to pray as those who seek his face. Before you come to God with all your problems. So that you remember, so, and this is throughout the day, not just in your prayer time. Every moment you can, Lord, I thank you for your blessing. In fact, it's many times when I drive and I see people sweeping the road and I see workers and say, thank God for your grace, Lord. The key is in that job most likely because of circumstances beyond his control. He did not choose the family he's born in. He did not choose the, the, the poverty level he was in. It was choices that was hard for him to succeed. Thank you, God, for your grace in my life. When I see people who've got a power less, I thank God for his grace. Yes. Don't take anything for granted. Yes. It could be you, what you see. It could be you begging for money. It could be you in the prison cell. It could be you in the hospital. How thankful are you? How thankful. We have no right to complain when you're grateful. Amen. We have no right. Because Lucifer was so ungrateful that I want to be in God's place. I'm not thankful for what I have. It's my right. My entitlement. I should be receiving worship. I don't believe the root of Lucifer's sin was in gratitude. The same sin of the Israelites. They were ungrateful for all that God did and they died in the wilderness. And caused 40 years of wandering because 10 pies were full of ingratitude and unbelief. This year, God against ingratitude. That's why we need to seek His face. But let me tell you, if you don't humble yourself to seek His face, you're walking in pride. So when you're not seeking, when you're distracted by darkness, there's a root of pride. Because of pride, we're distracted by what the enemy is doing. We're distracted by what's wrong with the world. We're distracted by what's wrong with kings, leaders, and governments. We are focused on all the problems in nations. We are focused on all the problems in people. And guess what? You will not praise God. As long as the enemy can distract you to focus on what is wrong, you will never be grateful or praising. How many of you know that Jesus didn't have perfect disciples? They weren't perfect. Jesus didn't go to the synagogue and ask the, the dean of the synagogue, I want your 12 brightest students. Who are your straight A students? And I'm looking for people to follow me. He didn't go to the, to the Ivy League seminary and find the top students. He went to the beach and looked for fishermen. Because it's less concerned about your brain but your heart. Because your heart's not right, your brain will never change. But no matter how little education you have, your heart is right, God will teach you. And you will learn and grow. Right? So God always looks at the heart and says, God, your heart will always do. That's why we need to humble ourselves and seek His face. Remind yourself of God's blessings. Why? So then, as Moses prayed, Exodus 33, Lord, if I have found grace in your sight, how? By humbling myself. Let me read that again, Exodus 33. Show me now your way that I may find grace in your sight. So the first grace is true humility. The second grace is 
for God to hear praise for give us sin and heal our land. So how does God really heal? How does God heal the land? It says the Bible says the heart of the king is in his hands. Right? And the Lord can turn the heart of kings in whichever way he chooses. So sometimes we've been so distracted, come election time. God, I want this prime minister, God, I want this president, God, I want this. It doesn't really matter who comes in. You know, the Bible history shows the good people end up bad and bad people become good. Just because you get the person you want doesn't mean to remain that way. Because the heart of the king is in God's hands. And so God doesn't command us to pray for leaders because they're perfect, but because they're leaders. 1 Timothy 2. First of all, pray for kings and all in authority that there will be peace in the land. Don't pray because they, they make all right decisions. Pray that God grace to be upon them. Right? So why does God want us to seek His face? And this is the next, I'm not sure what the order is, but very next very important reason. First is to stay in faith so we don't pray in unbelief. Otherwise, we will come to God based on what He hasn't done. And that's why many people don't pray. Because they're always thinking of their unanswered prayers. They're always thinking about what God never did for them. They're always thinking about all their problems. So who wants to pray, right? When you're always thinking about their problems. You know how to pray. But when you're always thinking about the goodness of God, when you're always thinking about what God has done, I'm full of faith, I'm going to pray, Lord, because of what He did. So what we think about really is faith or unbelief. You have faith, you want to pray. You're meditating on your problems, you have no faith to pray. So we need to humble ourselves to pray and remember His goodness. Why? And here's the important reason, Romans 3, 4. Because the goodness of God is to lead us to repentance. What's repentance? The change of thinking. To, be, to change the way we think. So that we will change the way we walk, we speak and we walk. So, what's the goodness of God right now? How many of you are thankful that COVID cases are decreasing? Amen. God is answering our prayers. I still remember early 2020, everybody had so such high hopes. By this June of July, 2020, the world will be normal, right? So many prophets were declaring, yes, this pandemic will be gone by June, July, 2020. One and a half years later, we are still going to it. <laughs> right? So, I, I don't know how many of you all kinds of fantastic prophecies two years ago. It never came up. So now, finally, there's some hope with the vaccines. But how are we going to handle our freedom? See, the purpose of, you remember the, the Palm Sunday, the Good Friday message, right? Or was it Palm Sunday? Palm Sunday. Where Jesus said the two donkeys were, were tied up. And the Lord sent his disciples to go and untie the, the donkey. Why? So that he could ride on them. See, the freedom of the donkey was not to have a merry life and gallop around. They were set free to carry his presence. Jesus wanted to ride on a donkey. You know what? That's a very unlikely animal. Jesus should have chosen a horse. Horses were created to be ridden, not donkeys. Donkeys are created to bear burdens, to carry heavy weights. Right? That's what Annie said. Sheep are not even created for burden bearing. Donkeys are. And Jesus chose to sit on the, donkey, on the burden bearer. Why? To show the difference when he is upon us. His burden is light, his yoke is easy. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. Right? So, if my people call by my name, humble themselves to pray, humble themselves to remember my goodness, guess what will happen? Moses prayer will be answered. God will reveal to you his ways. What are those ways? Those ways are how we live between our prayers. And it's amazing how it's so much easier to pray wonderful, sounding King James prayers is then live like an unbeliever after you say amen. You walk out of church, go back to your house, go to your office, and don't even know you're a believer. <laughs> Those are your ways. God says, if you're called by my name, and you don't want to pray so one of you, make sure the relation with me is seen in how you live between your prayers. That's why Jesus said, don't pray to look so spiritual in public. God sees how you pray in secret. What's the effect of my, my presence in your life? See, the first thing that prayer must change is not God, but you and me. If we are praying all day, every day, all our lives, and nothing is happening to us, our prayers are probably just hitting the scene. Is our level of faith increasing? Is our level of peace increasing? Uh, is our conversation of words changing? Is our relationships changing? And you know, the first time prayer is mentioned is when Jesus walked in, garden, in Eden, remember? Before the fall. We would walk in the cool of the garden. We had a fellowship. That was prayer. And then Eve would talk to him, listen to him, he would speak with them. And so it's, it's a lifestyle. Prayer is a lifestyle. And so when, when we seek his goodness, the goodness of God will be his, what's repentance? For us closer to him. So, but, so now what's the goodness of God? Okay, the pandemic, it's, it's, it's a lot closer to the end than last year or the year before. 
Right? So how are you going to handle this newfound freedom? Is this is that we can go back to the way we used to be? No. I believe God is going to do something new. Let us not waste the freedom He's giving us. His goodness must lead us to repentance. And this, when we don't realize the purpose of His goodness, the goodness stops. That is why almost every major revival in history has never continued. God calls out His Spirit, a revival happens, and with a matter of years, it breaks up. Nobody knows how to steward His blessing. You know, sometimes I think answer to prayer in revivals is a bit like a dog chasing a car. You know, the dog never expects the car to stop. And the car stops, the dog doesn't know what to do with the car. The Bible says the car is riding the tires. It's like the dog is lost. Like, run, 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 as long as you're moving. And then it gives up. When you stop the car, the, the dog, and sometimes you wonder, if God answers all your prayers, how do you respond? What is the purpose for God's goodness? He says, when you seek my face and turn from your... That's the purpose of prayer. You see, the land is not healed because of bad government. I mean, the, Lord, the land is not in need of healing because of bad leaders. Two Chronicles doesn't say, my people called by my name change the leadership of the church, of the nation. I will heal the land. If my people called by my name pray against their prime minister and president, I will heal the land. Mm. If my people called by my name turn from their wicked ways. You see, what does darkness tell us? Darkness tells us there is no light. Like, how many of you have heard of Sherlock Holmes and Watson? You heard of Sherlock Holmes? Okay, this, this very famous um, um, detective. He was, he was camping one night with his assistant Watson and, and they were both lying down and they were looking up. And Sherlock asked his assistant Watson, when you look up, what do you see? Watson said, oh, I see the constellations of the stars. Sherlock said, you've missed the most important point, Watson. It tells us our tent has been stolen. <laughs> <laughs> They should, have, they should have been looking at the roof of their tent, not the sky. Okay, so some, some of us are sold in their tent. Okay. So the, the point is, when God answers your prayer, okay, the, that's an, and that's the knowledge of His glory. You know what the Bible says? The earth shall be filled with the knowledge of God's glory. So why did God want us to come before Him singing, rejoicing, reminding? Why? So that after we seek his face, you shut your room door. I mean, you, you walk out of your house, you go to work, you go into the real world, guess what? You're entering the darkness. So when you enter the darkness, what did God expect you to be? The light. Now who's going to be the light? Those who saw his face before they walked out. Those who seek his face in the darkness. Because if you're not mindful of his goodness, you will react to the darkness. You will react to the scribes, Pharisees and Sadducees. And this, and this is a frightening thing. The scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees, and disciples of Jesus, all were people of prayer, all were believing in Jesus, only that the, the Jews didn't believe he was the Messiah. They all honored the scriptures, but they're two ends, two very different spirits. And so we are not seeking his faith, we will react to the darkness. We will focus on all the problems of what's wrong. What's wrong with everybody? What's wrong with the nation? What's wrong with the government? What's wrong with this person, that person? And guess what? We have no light to shine in the darkness. But when we seek His face, His goodness shines upon us so that when we face the darkness, we no longer react, we respond in faith. And the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of His goodness upon you and me. And that's why we need to testify of His goodness. And God says, okay, wonderful. I see you have humbled yourself, you are, you are praying with thanksgiving, you are praying with rejoicing, you are focused on my goodness and what I've done for you. And I'm going to reveal your ways so that when you say Amen, you're no longer going to think the same way, you're no longer going to speak the same way, you're no longer going to behave the same way. And as the ways begin to change, I will turn the hearts of people for the healing of the land. Because darkness prevails in the absence of light. You know, when we were the first person to walk into this room this morning, it was very dark. Guess what we did? We didn't have a prayer meeting to curse the darkness. You know, we didn't turn on the switch. Doesn't make sense, right? So if there is darkness in the land, if there is darkness, why? Because darkness prevails in the absence of light. Why is there no light? Because very few believers are praying as faith seekers. Most believers are praying as problem seekers. They are distracted by everything that is wrong. And not the goodness of God. And so when you don't come before God with the goodness, there is no light to bring healing. There is no salt to bring healing. So we want God to heal tonight. We want God to heal the nations. If you want to pray for your leaders and not against them, you need to be 
land, like, like Moses said, you know, God, if I found grace in your sight, through humility, show me your ways that I may know you, that I may find grace for the healing of these people, for the healing of the land, to fulfill your plan in my life. And the Lord says, my presence will go before you and I will give you rest. So that's, that's the heart of prayer. So what's the spirit of prayer? Pray with faith. Number one, how to pray in faith? Begin by rejoicing and with giving thanks. Rejoice always, pray without sinning. Don't pray without a heart of thanksgiving. Pray with the spirit of gratitude, that releases really faith. So you pray with the right spirit. You pray to become the answer to God's prayer. Because the Lord says, Father, the glory you give me, I have given them. The name may be one as we are one. So can you imagine with everybody who prays, prays with the goodness of God in mind, guess what? We begin to have the mind of Christ. We begin to be like-minded. We begin to be one, united by the goodness of God. That's like the difference between the restored prodigal and the elder brother who never left home. See, the elder brother and the restored prodigal never became one. Because only one knew the goodness of the father, the other was not thankful. He thought everything he had was his right, his entitlement. He deserved to be fed. But the prodigal who came home appreciated the goodness of the father. The, the, so there's oneness with him and the dad, but not with the brother. So when we become face seekers together, when we walk in gratitude together, and I believe this is what happened in the upper room. The heart of Trinity waited 10 days. We're going to receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to close now. You know what prayer, prayer does when you pray this way? You become sick and tired of being status quo spiritually. Lord, you know, many of us say, somebody said, revivals are moves the God of birth through spiritual hunger. Why are some hungry and some not? Because some seek his face in some form. I said, always thank God. God, thank you. Uh, the wedding of Cana, Mary and was not satisfied with water. Jesus neither was Jesus satisfied with water. Right? Mary could have said, Jesus, they ran out of wine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Now they can drink what is healthy for them. Okay? Besides, mother, water is cheaper and free and healthy. They don't need more wine. They've had enough wine for the night. No, no, no. How many of us are satisfied with spiritual water? God, I'm happy with my life as now it is. I'm happy with no miracles, no, no, no gifts, no power. I'm happy with water. If you're not hungry, you will get nothing. Now, prayer stirs up your spiritual hunger. Say, Lord, you did it before, you said you did it really again. This is the year for 22 Chronicles 20 22. Begin to magnify the Lord and see the Lord take care of your enemies. Let the goodness of the glory shine upon you to shine in the darkness. As your ways begin to change, next week to come to John 14 6. Like Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life, God comes to the Father except through me. So the more we become like Jesus, the more many will come to the Father through you. Amen. In a nutshell. Right? And that's why we call to become like him. So just as he drew people to the Father, we will draw people to the Father and not to ourselves. Let's stand up and pray.